Mac and Marco, thanks for having us here at the Juventus Creator Lab and uh, welcome again on the Football Co Business Podcast. Of course, uh, we are here to talk about uh, uh, the Juventus uh, Creator Lab. The first question is uh, why you have created this project and uh, how is the different from another in-house club studio? Yeah, so first, uh, thanks for having us. It's a privilege. Maybe if it's okay with you, I could give some color to the listeners just on where we are today, where we're talking. Uh, and so where we're located today is we're uh, amongst the Juventus village. We're right in between the headquarters and the player training facility. We're also very close to the Juventus hotel, uh, the stadium, J Medical. So we're right in the, the thick of the action. And so the building that we're in right now uh, will soon undergo a transformation that will become the Juventus Creator Labs physical space. Um, but um, really the Juventus Creator Lab is a team of people that have been working really hard on uh, production over the last months, since about January, I'd say, with this new mandate to build content for new audiences, uh, for our global fan base. I'd say the, um, the why behind it, uh, if we go back a little bit, uh, I joined the company a year and nine months ago. Uh, I joined after uh, many years of Juventus uh, winning in uh, the Italian league. Uh, having some great Champions League runs, uh, having uh, Ronaldo, uh, the world's uh, number one social media star, uh, leave. Uh, and um, in my background over the last uh, six years prior to that was uh, really in, uh, in eSports uh, and working for Google uh, on the YouTube side of the business. And so one uh, observation that uh, I had early on was we needed to run a, a different playbook from some of the other clubs. Um, and uh, we needed to to change how we serviced our, our global fan base, our young fans, and the future audience. Um, if you look at the clusters of fans that we have, we have fans around the world that can't watch a live broadcast because of maybe time zone. They can't watch because uh, there's a, a rights broadcast issue in their region. They don't want to watch because they don't want to pay. Uh, or maybe they're just uh, not interested in watching a full match, which is OK, too. Uh, and they can watch highlights. They can consume snackable content for us. Um, but our hardest job is to appeal to this global fan base, provide them with access and transparency that, um, that they deserve and that they should have. And so the idea was, how can we build a team and a group of individuals that um, try to unpack content for the next generation? Um, the physical space won't be traditional in any means, so you're not going to see a, uh, the classic sports desk with, uh, I don't want to get in trouble, but the stereotypical man behind it, or woman for that matter. Uh, it's going to feel more like, hopefully, uh, an LA style influencer house uh, or a gaming studio. And uh, that's the effect that we're going for. Is the lab uh, responsible uh, for both long and medium form content, uh, or is this now where all Juventus uh, content uh, comes from? Uh, I would say all Juventus content come from. Um, let's uh, take into consideration a normal week here at Juventus with, for example, two games. We distribute on uh, our uh, content ecosystem an average of uh, 1,500 pieces of content. When I talk about like the Juventus content ecosystem, I talk about like everything is like a quite large and complex content ecosystem uh, composed by the social media ecosystem. Western media and Chinese media, so we take care also of the Chinese media ecosystem, and then the own and operated, so the website and the, and the mobile app, and then the OTT, our OTT Juventus TV. So if you consider like this whole ecosystem, we're talking about like 1500 content on average distributed per week. And when we talk about content and when we think about content, actually like everything can be considered content, you know, so like text, a piece of text, a picture, a graphic, a visual, a motion design, a video production. So if you include all these content, we get to that uh, to that number. Sometimes, especially in social media, like uh, the right text distributed on the right time on the right platform can be more impactful and powerful than a video production. You know? So that's why here we have like uh, content managers who are able to understand which kind of content to pick in the right moment and to distribute on the right channel in order to be most effective uh, possible. Uh, among like these uh, 1,500 uh, content that we, we distributed on a weekly basis, let's say that half of that are related to the pitch. So what happened on the pitch, so on the games, so they are related to what happened on the games. And the other 50% are not related to what happened on the games and are more like focused on a wider audience, as Mike was saying, uh, talking about like uh, different kind of topics in different, uh, in different way. Mike, going back to March, uh, the first piece of the content to come from the Creator Lab was uh, a Chiesa documentary and uh, back on track, of course. Uh, can you tell us uh, how did you come up uh, with this idea? 
Yeah, so I guess first, uh, for the listeners who maybe don't know Chiesa, so Chiesa is a star player on Juventus. He's a young player. Uh, he's seen also as a, a strong player on the Italian national team. Uh, I'd say he's well-loved because of his, his talent on the pitch, but also his, uh, his work ethic, his emotion, his passion. And I think that's uh, one of the things that um, really draws people to him. Um, when uh, he had uh, uh, such a tremendous injury, we knew that he was going to be out for some time. And really, uh, some credits deserve to Matteo Fabrice, the team manager, who really was very supportive early on in um, providing us with the opportunity to have access to, to Chiesa to work with him in, in sports. Uh, on the marketing side, you're, you're nothing if you don't have your counterpart in the sports area that helps you. Um, and so um, for us, there was just a, a, a great opportunity to, um, to tell a story and to uh, allow our, our global fan base access to that. Um, we discussed a lot like what the right platform would be for it. Um, and so, you know, do we put it on owned or do we put it on uh, where we ended up going? So we, we ended up going with Amazon Prime. Um, and for us, uh, I'm sure we'll get into it at some point, but um, we have a, I'd say, different point of view on own video platforms. Um, and Amazon is a phenomenal partner that was able to carry the, the content uh, worldwide in multiple languages. Uh, and so for us, it was um, a great test in a, a first production that we did. Uh, we'd worked with Netflix and Amazon in the past, um, but in those cases, they really took on the, the production. Why did you focus on this story and not go down in terms of, uh, for example, pitch stories? Um, well, sometimes uh, um, I think that um, from a club's perspective, what, what is happening like around the, pe the pitch, so the, on the behind the scene can be in a way like uh, more relevant uh, th than what is happening on the pitch. I mean, uh, what is happening on the pitch is not really a secret for most of the time because like that part is already owned by broadcasters all over the world that they show what, what is happening on the pitch, the match, the highlights and stuff like that. But when it comes to the behind the scenes, so when it comes to, as Mike was saying, like getting access, like close and intimate access to the Juventus facilities, for example, and the life of the players. So what is happening like in their life when it, when it not related to, to the pitch, then is when the Juventus Creator Lab, I think, can, uh, can have his word. I mean, we are Juventus. Juventus people worked on the project. We know the sport era. We know the players. We are in close relationship with them. So we really have like, had like uh, very incredible access to Federico Chiesa. We went to his house. We went to his parents' house. We went with him to Innsbruck in order to, uh, to meet like the doctor that managed the, the surgery. Uh, so, I mean, uh, in the documentary, uh, there is a, a great access of the behind the scene, which is what people are a little bit less used to. So we thought that a behind the scenes story could, uh, could have been uh, like uh, at least as impactful as uh, what is happening on the pitch or sometimes even more. So that's why we, we chose to focus on the behind the scene rather than what was happening on the pitch. What did you learn from Alor Nothing? We learned that uh, everything is possible in a way. I mean, uh, actually for Juventus, All or Nothing was uh, a good training, a good school, because uh, the Amazon guys, I mean, I was not here at that time, but I've been told that the, Am the Amazon guys and the, Ad the Amazon production team uh, was here like uh, for a year long, every day. So people, in a way, got used to have like cameras around them. And even the sport area and the players got used to have like cameras around them. So we relied on this like uh, training in order to go for Chiesa. So when we went for Chiesa, we had like the sport area and the company itself uh, was like uh, used to have like cameramen and production teams uh, around them. And that was a big possibility for us because uh, I mean, we were able to move like in a kind of same way and that's why we got the access and we relied on the access that is shown in the documentary. So we have to say that all or nothing, I mean, trained a lot, like the football industry, in order to like, open the door to things that uh, were never seen before. Mike, where does OTT sit in Juventus' plan for growth uh, compared to own and operate on channels? Yeah, so uh, my opinion on uh, video-specific OTTs is uh, somewhat different, I'd say, from, from other clubs. Um, we struggle to see uh, a significant material impact um, and video club owned OTTs seem to be incongruent with industry trend. Um, it's, uh, it's not that we don't see the opportunity on a, a data side, but we, um, we don't see the industry trend going this way. If you look at what's happening, uh, the industry is extremely fragmented. You've got content everywhere. We've made it very difficult for our fan base to get access. 
Um, one uh, very maybe pragmatic example is uh, your mobile phone. So most video OTTs are uh, accessed through your mobile phone on the app. So six years ago I was at Google and the average stat was most people have anywhere from 80 to 90 apps on their phone. Uh, I have around 120. Um, do a count, see how many you have. I think you'll be surprised. The reality is most people use, spend 95% of their time with six. So if you spend 95% 90, of your time with six apps, we can guess who the owners of those apps are. Google, Meta, Amazon, Netflix, Disney. So if you're a club wanting to build a video specific OTT, you have to compete with those six and every other app on people's phones. Uh, what that means is you need to invest heavily in a technology product that's good because today people expect, society expects personalization, automation. They want the app to, to work really, really well. And then on the other hand, as a club where you have restrictions on IP, uh, it's very different from a league, uh, you need to have content that is so exclusive that they're going to come back every single day. And if they don't, then the model doesn't work. And so you end up having to put together a subscription-based model, which um, is playing, again, against industry trend, where people want free access, not paid access. And so um, it's not to say that um, I don't see or we don't see that uh, there's opportunity to have platforms or projects that connect with our fan base on a one-to-one. -one. It's not that we don't see the data upside to a video OTT. Uh, we just believe that it goes counter to the fragmentation that we're seeing in the industry. Marco, spoiler time. Hashtag spoiler time. Uh, should we expect uh, new stuff, new films in the coming month? Yes, of course. I mean, we after the Chiesa, let's say, the, let's, call, let's call the Chiesa one uh, our first pilot of the Juventus Creator Lab, and after that we we kind of saw that there is like a potential in a potentiality in this kind of, uh, of project and there is demand. Uh, so right after we worked a lot in the Juventus Creator Lab, we brainstormed a lot and we built like a catalog of like uh, nice and uh, interesting stories about Juventus that actually we are able to, to tell and to produce on our own. Uh, so at the moment we, we have like this, uh, this catalog and with a variety of, of topics uh, like archive, history of the past, uh, the women's team, the first team, the next gen, uh, the academies, uh, the youth sector, you know. So we have really, we, we've got, we think that we've got a lot of interesting stories to sell. And, uh, and the interesting part is that we are also building internally the capability to produce them on our own. So we hope that uh, what we did with, with Chiesa was like the first of uh, many projects and original products. Like, uh, like that one. Do you think that uh, to create a similar uh, series to like uh, Drive to Survive regarding the F1 could help to put the spotlight back in, uh, on the league? Yeah, I mean, I love this question. I think it would be really fun. I think the uh, Syria has, uh, has had a very interesting year. We've got a lot of strong teams. Uh, I love the idea of it. I think uh, pragmatically what the, the league, and I, I can't speak for the league, but the, what the league would need to resolve is how do you get uh, across uh, cooperation from the teams and then um, through the, the media rights and the rights sharing that wouldn't need to happen. And so in uh, Drive to Survive, you've got, uh, I should know this, maybe 12, 13 teams in Formula One. Uh, in Serie A, you've got 20. And so now you need to tell a story that profiles 20 teams. Uh, to make sure that there's fairness. So the teams would really need to all see the greater good of doing something like this and be okay that there'd be maybe have or have not teams in the story, so more practically. Uh, because generally the producer would want to tell a story that would focus on the star players, the winning teams, uh, maybe interesting subjects that would happen, but it would be really, really difficult to give uh, fair coverage of, let's say, all the teams in the league. So these are just some pr pragmatic details I think that would need to get figured out. Marco. With the next gen, what about this project? With the next gen, so yeah, uh, for, for the ones who don't know, uh, first of all, I mean, the next gen is the second team of uh, Juventus. Uh, they play in the, in the third league here in Italy, in Serie C. And actually this year they achieved like um, a very important uh, event, uh, milestone, which was like the, the final of the Coppa Italia of the third league, the Serie C. Uh, so that for us was like the possibility to create a story around them. And we did it together with TikTok. So actually we, the next gen is, uh, 
uh, the first uh, TikTok, let's say, original series that the Juventus Creator Lab produced together with TikTok. Actually, I have to say that with TikTok, we have a, a very good relationship, a very open relationship. We talk with them like uh, uh, quite often, we brainstorm, you know, they really see Juventus as like a place to experiment like everything uh, for, uh, for the platform and we like the approach and we like the idea. So during one of the brainstorming that we have with them, they, we were talking about like original content and series, mini series and like long form for TikTok, vertical shot and we said like together, okay, so why don't we try to do together uh, the first ever uh, TikTok uh, series of uh, football club uh, on the platform. And then we said like, wow, let's go for that, you know. And actually it was like uh, tricky because on one side, when you are like uh, in a way a first mover, there are no references. So actually we had like a white paper in front of us uh, and we tried to understand how to produce this kind of uh, new concept for, uh, for TikTok. But then on the other side, it was like very exciting, especially like for, uh, for the people and for the staff here because uh, it was uh, like the first time. So actually we uh, literally like uh, took a seat with uh, TikTok and we built this uh, together. And now you can, uh, you can watch it like on our TikTok page. It's like five episodes of five minutes with the behind the scene of uh, the approach the live and the after, uh, the Coppa Italia Serie C final of the Juventus uh, next uh, gen. And it was like, from a, from a production point of view, it was uh, in a way challenging because, I mean, uh, when you shoot something like TikTok first, vertical first, you literally shoot this vertical. Uh, and the language and the tone of voice is, uh, is uh, in a way different, you know, is the one that the platform uh, requests. So we worked hard in order to understand uh, how to do this, but then in the end, I think uh, we, we are happy with what we, we produced and we've got. And in, terp in terms of production, is it harder to create content uh, that is very TikTok compared to a more traditional edit like, uh, for example, Kesa Film? I, don't, I wouldn't say that one is more difficult than the other one, but they are like, two, like completely two different production, two different languages for maybe two different audiences. So, I mean, uh, uh, we love the fact that here at the Juventus Creator Lab, as I, as I said before, we have like content managers able to work with content, you know? So when you are a content manager, you know how to manage content for different needs, you know? So on one side, you do like a mini series on TikTok, uh, vertical first for uh, an international Gen Z uh, audience. And on the other side, you do like uh, more, let's say more traditional video, long form production for Amazon, for a more like local and, uh, and the hardcore audience. I mean, uh, it's not that one is more difficult than the other one, but I think you need to be nimble nowadays in 2023 when you work with content, you need to be very flexible and nimble with content in order to understand how to work on that. If I could add, uh, I think um, one thing too that is misunderstood maybe is the, the frequency that's required. And so like this season, Juventus has uh, two, billion, 2 billion more video views than we did a year ago. And so the output that's required by Marco and the team and the Creator Lab is tremendous uh, to just keep up with the demands and have the right kinds of content across platforms. The numbers are quite staggering. Juventus are pushing a lot in terms of the out sector. There are a lot of players from the out sector next gen to the first team. Do you think that uh, that could help? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I think in any mature league, it's important to help uh, with uh, the next generation that, that's coming in. Uh, Juventus, uh, we believe that we've been innovative here. We've been investing in our next gen players for a while. I mean, the team was called under 23. We rebranded them to next gen just to reinforce that point. Uh, I think uh, it's, it's important for, for the, the industry. It's important for the team. Uh, to continue to support who's coming next. Hopefully they land on Juventus, maybe they go to another club, but either way, we're, we're helping the system overall. What about the Giampaolo Sgura project? Yeah, so for those who don't know, Giampaolo Sgura is uh, someone we had the pleasure to work with. He's a world-famous fashion photographer. Uh, he's worked with uh, Hollywood celebrities around the world. He's worked with uh, uh, top fashion labels, with magazines like Vogue and GQ. And so we had an opportunity to work with him. Actually, it was uh, someone on our uh, uh, PR team. Uh, he was uh, Edo Bandini, a PR manager at the time, who was uh, close with uh, Giampaolo, who's also a Juventus fan. Uh, and the idea was, uh, what if we could celebrate his career's work during the Milan Fashion Week in black and white, uh, alongside also some Juventus players? And what that allowed us to do is to have a uh, football meets fashion meets uh, art studio set up uh, in Milano uh, and, uh, and have an exhibit and an event in the evening. 
uh, to really profile uh, Juventus amongst uh, all these uh, worldwide uh, celebrities. Uh, so it was a great opportunity for us, and then um, it provided some, some opportunities for content too, which I, I'll, I'll let, of course, Marco speak to. And uh, how Adidas were involved? Uh, Adidas is a, is a great partner. They're very collaborative with us. Um, for them, it was a natural fit uh, because their, their apparel was, was worn by the players. Uh, it was uh, an activation that had to do with fashion and, uh, and fashion week. And so um, they came in to support as a, as a key player in the, in the, in the project. Marco, it was uh, mostly about Giampaolo Scura and not about uh, the players. Uh, what was the thing about behind that? I mean, when it comes to football, Juventus, uh, Juventus and any other football club is credible because football is our core. But when you approach like other topics, I think you need a strategic partnership uh, in order to reach like the same credibility. You know, so that's what we, we did with uh, with uh, John Paolo. I mean, uh, the content was around him because he was like the star in a way for the fashion industry that we wanted to approach. So actually, we want to we wanted to tell the story around him and Juventus rather than Juventus uh, and, and him because he was like the, uh, the, the main star of the project. And uh, when you don't talk about like your, uh, your, your core topic, uh, you, you need that, you need strategic partnership. So for fashion is uh, John Paul Sgura. We approach like other industry like this year, like esports, gaming, for example, design. And when you do that uh, and you are a football club, you really need like to um, to get like the support and the help of someone that uh, has already credibility and has already like in a way an audience uh, in, in that industry. So that's why I mean uh, the what we shot, which is like another documentary, like same same back on track, uh, is uh, is now like on uh, on Amazon Prime for the Italian market and on our YouTube account for the international market. But the main character was uh, was uh, John Paolo, and then there were like uh, Juventus players uh, collaborating in a way with him. Uh, the players were like Fagioli, Pogba and uh, Vlaovic. Actually, I mean, when you, when you do like this project, like first of all, you want to be like uh, credible in a way, you know? So when it comes to especially other industries, uh, you want to select players that are genuinely and organically, like in a way, interested about the topic. Otherwise, it doesn't work. I mean, it's, it's forced, you know? So when it came to, to fashion and to select like the players uh, uh, to collaborate with John Paul on this project, uh, we know our players, we know what they love to do besides uh, football and we knew that uh, Fagioli, Vlaovic and Pogba were in a way already interested about the topic, the fashion, and that's why we chose them and that's why we think that the project worked because they were generally interested about what they were doing. You know? So I think that the key factor when you do things like that is you have to be credible, you have to be transparent and you select the players by their, real, uh, like their genuine uh, passions. Mike, it's uh, really important to be partnered with a creative, creative uh, like Sgura. Yeah, I think, uh, as Marco said, it, uh, it provides authenticity. It also provides an opportunity for us to learn. I mean, we get to partner with uh, a great worldwide photographer, and so there's a great learning opportunity for us. And so I think it helps on the authenticity side, and it helps on us continuing to challenge ourselves uh, to, to new levels. What's the goal of the Juventus Creator Lab? <laughs> I think, uh, for me, I would say, it boils down to, to three things. One is, uh, first and foremost, our fans. And so that global audience, that young audience, uh, the new audience that I talked about earlier, um, we have an opportunity to give them uh, the different types and styles of content that they deserve to see, um, to allow them connection to the company, to the brand, to the players, regardless of if we're winning or losing. Um, if I look back over the last six months, uh, I'd say we've launched uh, two Amazon documentaries. We've told stories about three of our next-gen players. We've told a documentary about a really important human story on our women's team. We've experimented with uh, freestyle football. And so really in six months, um, we've done a lot for our fan base that uh, you didn't see uh, before. And so I'd say I'm feeling very good about the direction that the team's taken and, and that, that, that first goal, which is to service our fans. The second is reputation, and so I think it's important for our partners to see that we're leading, we're innovating, we understand youth culture, uh, we're trying uh, new, new formats and channels. And then the third is, of course, economics. Uh, and on that one, I'm, I'm confident as well because we're not overextending ourselves. We're, we're building this as a, as a business, as a startup, one step at a time. And so um, there's no overextension there. And so on the economics front, uh, it's not a concern that I have either. Mike and Marco, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.